Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath, church. Well, I thank God for giving me the opportunity, privilege to speak before you. The title of uh, the message today is uh, Lifting Christ or Lift Him Up. And uh, I pray that the Lord will be with us as we study this uh, topic. The Andrews University has conducted a survey, and one of the questions asked in the survey is who is the most influential person in the lives of the millennials? And it was found out that uh, among the most influential persons in the lives of the millennials, 95% of them said that it is their mother. Secondarily, their fathers, and you can, do, you can draw the line. You have the friends, teachers, grandparents, family, friends, siblings. The youth pastors are also influential, but less influential than the parents, the pastors, and the Sabbath school teacher. You can see the significance of the parents and uh, a little bit of the significance of the church. Andy Nash, a professor in uh, Andrews University, also conducted his own, uh, like a replica of this survey. And even in his own classroom, he was able to find out that mothers, fathers are the most significant, influential person in the lives of the young. But another question was asked, who gives you the assurance of salvation the most? And when the result was verified, it was the church pastor. You can see that before, the pastors are down beneath in the power of influence. But when it comes to the, the assurance of salvation, you can see that the mother has the less of that power to assure them of salvation. This is kind of a, an alarming result. I don't know why, but uh, maybe because of the obligation of the parents for you to obey and to do this and to obey and to do that, and the fathers and mothers were, beyond, were behind in that survey. Today, I'm going to talk about the assurance of salvation. And I think just like rice, I went to the U.S. for 14 days. I went to 14 states doing a LNG White Heritage Tour all around across the 14 states of the United States. The problem was for 14 days, I was not able to eat rice. The food was wonderful. It was all about salad, vegetarian food, good food. But 14 days without rice is horrific <laughs> for a Filipino. Until on the last day when the white estate declared that we would go to a Chinese buffet. And there I rejoice. For Filipinos, viand are good food. Entries are good food. But without rice, it is not as good as having rice every day. The assurance of salvation must be preached every single morning or evening, and we should not run out of it. Amen? Salvation, the assurance of our own salvation, justification, must always be assured among Christians. Without justification, there is no sanctification whatsoever. Ellen White said, the sphere of the mother may be humble, but their influence, united with the fathers, is an abiding as eternity. Next to God, the mother's power for good is the strongest. And I, I want to make underline on it. Next to God, the power of the mother's power to go, do good is the strongest known on earth. The mother's influence is unceasing influence. You know, Ellen White also asked, I'm in the white estate now. Ellen White also said, now when we go to heaven, many of the mothers will be rewarded of the things that we didn't know 
were the influence. There would be no Martin Luther or John Wesley or William Miller without faithful mothers. Many of those are not recorded but be, will be rewarded in heaven. When Ellen White was a child, she grew up in a Methodist church. And you know, in the Protestant, they continue to emphasize on justification, less on sanctification. But in John Wesley's time, he emphasized on sanctification, of course, in the line of justification. But during Ellen White's time, it was confused. The two was combined together. The worst was not a combination, was that sanctification is a requirement for justification. <laughs> and in Ellen White's time, she was confused of these ideas. She didn't have that assurance of salvation. It was a confused salvation. My ideas concerning justification and sanctification were confused. These two states were presented to my mind as separate and distinct from each other. Of course, having known from child about these things, she was able to find out as she grew up that sanctification is a work of a lifetime and justification is momentous. It is momentous. And it's not just momentous. It is always momentous. Yet, she said in Life Sketches, yet I failed to comprehend the difference or understand the meaning of those two terms, justification and sanctification. And all the explanations of the preachers increased even more my difficulties. I was unable to claim the blessings for myself. And I think it's not only Ellen White, even Seventh-day Adventists would struggle in the ideas of justification and sanctification. Even now, many would explain it in another way. Every person would explain it in a different way. And sometimes, or in many times, as they explain it, they explain it away or are confused. The end result is that no assurance of salvation whatsoever. You know, since we were a child, we were oriented that everything goes by works. You have to hit this standard, you have to hit this standard from traffic lights to, to grades in the grade school. All are based on works. And in order for you to be accepted, you must hit the target. There was never an idea of substitution whatsoever in this world. Substitution is not accepted in this earth. So no matter how you explain substitution, by the way, the gospel can only be explained briefly, not only be explained, but one of the most wonderful words to explain the gospel is none other than substitution. Ellen White always state the word substitution. The second word is surety, but surety is even more confusing with the word substitution. In, 18, in 1844, Ellen White was called to be the messenger of God. William Foy was one of those that, was, that has accepted the call to, you know, to share his visions. But the, the, the work of William Foy was to prepare the Advent message for uh, the Advent uh, believers for the great disappointment. But uh, his enforce was called to encourage the discouraged flock, but was not able to proclaim. He died as an unreligious unbeliever. But at the time when he did not accept the call to proclaim the message, Ellen White was called as the weakest of the week and she was called in a very humble way in Rhode Islands they were praying five of them were praying and they were praying for encouragement and indeed encouragement came in a form of a vision and there was a long vision but let me just give you the hint of that vision and not only the hint of that vision the main idea of the vision and the main idea for the Seventh-day Adventist Church and this is the main idea. Perhaps the mission of Ellen G. White in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
can be summarized in just one sentence. She said, and the angel said, and if they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, if they kept their eyes, the word is kept, meaning you don't just look on Jesus at one time. You constantly look at Jesus at all times, in all manners, at whatever situation. If they keep their eyes upon Jesus, who was just before them. I like this. Before. Before you have trials, before you have success, Jesus always comes before you. You just keep your eyes upon him. Remember, if you abide in me, you will bear fruit. If you don't abide in me, no matter how you try, you won't bear fruit. And the word was a, as long as they kept their eyes upon Jesus, leading them to the city, they were safe. There were two clefts on both sides. And many of them has gone astray, either in the, in the coldness of indifference or in the, in the fire of fanaticism. Many Seventh-day Adventists has gone astray from this church. One on the liberal side, another on the conservative side. But only those that is in the side of Christ survives. Amen? Only those who are in the side of Christ survives. And another vision was given to Ellen White, perhaps a dream. It was a long road going to the city. They were on wagon, riding wagon, bandwagon. But they have to leave their wagons and, you know, walk on foot with their luggages. But as the road started to get narrow and narrower and narrower, they have to leave behind their luggages up to the point that they really have to leave behind their shoes. For the blood-stained wall is getting steeper and steeper until there is no longer anymore anything to put their foot on. When they were about to fall, there was a string, a cord from heaven. It was a, a thin, as just a strand. But when they hold it and put weight on it, it gets bigger and bigger. And when they put all their trust on it and less trust on their feet, you know, on, on the road, it gets bigger until it gets bigger, as big as their own bodies and they were asking the question who holds the cord and somebody would shout god holds the cord we need not fear we will not fail us now he will not fail us now he has brought us thus far in safety if he has kept us in safety he will keep us in safety until they reach the other side of jerusalem this was the same message as if calling every one of us to leave behind even our love of our own opinions and look to Christ. We cannot trust neither anything in this world or anything from our own efforts. Nothing can be trusted except the cord that comes from God, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way he is the truth and he is the life so whenever we open the scriptures seek jesus christ because he is the cord he does not only hold the cord he is the cord ellen g white commission um, james white commissioned a sketch in order for them to to at least give us the idea of what the plan of redemption is talking about on the, the first sketch that was commissioned in 1876, you can see that the cross is on the middle, but you can see that in the tree, there are 10 commandments. But before he died, as they continue to comprehend the message of the Lord, James White wrote a letter to Ellen White that he, he will commission another sketch. Another painting was commissioned in order to portray the plan of salvation. At the right side, you can see that it was only the cross, not even the Ten Commandments 
was included. The center of the sketch is Jesus and him crucified and nothing else. Even the other sketches were just small. Depicting the development of understanding of Seventh-day Adventists regarding salvation. And on that picture, left alone, is the cross and nothing else. What is the meaning of this? The understanding of the Seventh-day Adventists grew and grew so that they fix their eyes upon Jesus even more. Amen? Jesus is the bread. Jesus is my daily rice. Amen? He should be the first and foremost of all the message of the Seventh-day Adventists. Many Seventh-day Adventists are known of not eating pork or keeping the Sabbath. But we must be known of a Christian that uplift Jesus Christ and Him crucified, nothing more, nothing less. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. If we want to draw people to Jesus, speak about Jesus more and more. In, on her death in July 16, 1915, 70 years after she was called in 1844, 26 books after and 200 tracts and pamphlets after, 5,000 periodicals, 6,000 typewritten letters, 100,000 pages of material from 126 titles available in English, and after 2,000 vision, Ellen White rested to give us one exact legacy. And the only legacy that she left is Jesus and Him crucified. And because of Him, because of her lifting Jesus Christ up, the fruit of salvation is already seen. Members during that time rose and exploded to 100,000. Now this 100,000 is only Central Luzon Conference. <laughs> the publishing houses grew to 37 publishing houses, out of, many out of which were visions of Ellen White to publish and publish and publish while others are proclaiming that the work is done. The shut door theory. Ellen White continued to press, no, the work has just begun. Remember what the Bible says, prophesy again to every nation, kindred, and tongue. If you have the opportunity to come to the second service, I'll talk about God's mission. Sanitariums grew up to 34, colleges were 70, elementary schools were 510, and languages they were able to reach were 36 during the death of Ellen White. What, was this, what does this portray? Because of the proclamation of Christ, many were able to know the gospel. Upward look. Ellen White says, your salvation depends on your hearing aright. And receiving with meekness the engraft word. Salvation is on the interpretation. Many of those who received the message were not able to have assurance of salvation because they miss read either the writings of Ellen White or the scriptures more importantly. It is the supreme importance that you hear aright. It is most important that you hear aright, that you purify your hearts from selfishness for your eternal welfare is at stake. Interpretation of the scripture is at stake. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about how to interpret the scripture one-eyed, eye fixed on the glory of God. One time, Uriah Smith published, after 1888 Minneapolis Conference, the Righteousness, of God, uh, Righteousness by Faith Conference, I would say, A.T. Jones and Wagoner was preaching at the top of their voice the Advent message and the Righteousness by Faith message. Many were blessed. But among those who were not able to dis discern was Uriah Smith. And Uriah Smith even published in the Review and Herald, 1889, these words. <clears throat> and I hope you do not harmonize with this. The law is spiritual, that's good. Holy and just and good. The divine standard of righteousness, 
Perfect obedience to it will develop perfect righteousness. Many Seventh-day Adventists believe this, that the more we obey the law, the more we become righteous. So our righteousness is from obeying the law. And by default, many Seventh-day Adventists will always say, of course, yes. And then she said, perfect obedience to it will develop perfect righteousness. So where do you get your perfect righteousness? From your perfect obedience. Of course, with the help of God. <laughs> and that only the way anyone can attain to righteousness is to perfectly obey the law. Now the question is, does this harmonize on the scriptures? Can human beings obey the law, weak as they are? Ellen White responded with a letter. She said in manuscript letter S, in 1889, she said, he doesn't know what he is talking about. Doesn't know what he's talking about. He sees trees as men walking. As I go around the Philippines and in other countries, the Seventh-day Adventist, by default, goes to Uriah Smith's preposition. And they do not only put the, the Ten Commandments there, they put more than the Ten Commandments. They add vegetarianism, dress reform, and all kinds of reform. And without all these reforms, we cannot attain righteousness. And even when I preach last in the camp meeting last day, Thursday, I preach there that you know, I preached there about righteousness and the righteousness of Christ. An elder approached me and said, Pastor, I do not have any, you know, anything against your your preaching, but I think in order to be justified, you must first be sanctified. Now, where do you get your assurance of salvation? Unless you are sanctified, are you assured of your salvation? You cannot be sanctified unless you are assured of your salvation. And where do you get your salvation? From yourself or from outside of yourself? Because there is nothing good that comes out of, our, of, of ourselves. Our heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked. And who shall know it? You don't even know you're wicked. And whatever comes out of us, nothing good if there is anything good that comes out of us it does not come out of us it comes from god amen it is impossible for us to exalt the law of jehovah unless we take hold of the righteousness of christ take hold first of that righteousness that comes from christ and then by that power you can keep the law amen but it is not you who keeps the law it is christ that keeps it for you amen for god is at work within you both to do for both to will and to do his good pleasures philippians chapter 2 verse 13 it is true men say ellen white was preaching and one time when she was preaching she was giving an analogy says yes it is it is true that men will say you are too excited you are making too much of this matter and you do not think enough of the law. Now you must think more of the law. I'm hearing a Seventh-day Adventist, authentic Seventh-day Adventist here. Don't be all the time reaching for the righteousness of Christ. Build up the law. Ellen White was preaching. And then she commented, let the law take care of itself. We have been at work on the law. Seventh-day Adventists are masters of the law. But tell them, can you give me 10 texts about the gospel, the assurance of salvation, righteousness by faith? They couldn't even give one. Maybe Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and the rest, it's gone. What assurance do we have if the law, what assurance the law has? Something that we can do? Because salvation is something that God has done, God has been doing, and God will do. But if you talk about the law, you're talking about what you can do, and there is nothing that we can do to have an assurance of salvation. 
Assurance of salvation is something that we can claim, not something that we can do. Because assurance of salvation is something that God has done. Our response to that is a positive claim, a positive belief. And by that belief, by faith, we have the assurance of salvation. Amen. We have been at work on the law until we get as dry as the hills of Gilboa. How many of you has gone from the church hearing the preaching and yet have not rested just because the preacher has again given you more burden? Such preaching as you have to be faithful, you have to obey, you have to be, you know, you have to be good, you have to be kindly, you have to, you have, to have the fruit of salvation. All of this is how and what. But they don't preach the why. They don't preach the reason. They don't preach the fountain of love that we must respond and harmonize to. The power of the preaching does not come from what we can do for the gospel or what we can do for God. Many of these sermons would say there are three points. We must be faithful, we must be loving, we must be and we must be. But this is beyond our nature. We only respond to what God continues to do through us or in us. We cannot even love God. No matter how you think of it, every day you think of it, I must love God, but you continue to argue with yourself because love does not come from within. It is just a response to what He has done. So every day you seek your scriptures not to love God, but to know how God loves you. And by knowing, the heart responds positively. The only love we can love is to love ourselves. Nothing more, nothing less. But when we understand daily, hourly, minute by minute, that God loves us, it continues to beat and beat, love dub, love dub in response to God's love. We must continue to seek the love of God. That's why in many preaching, we preach on the top of our voice as dry as the hills of Gilboa without moist, without dew, without rain. Let us trust in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth alone. But often, this is the fact, often the cross of Calvary is not presented before the people. Yes, Often, Calvary has not been preached so much. Jesus, from the very beginning of Genesis, started to prepare Calvary. And all throughout all the prophets, remember what Jesus said in Emmaus, Are you so slow in heart and so foolish that you do not believe the prophets? You are slow to believing the prophets that the Messiah must suffer? The suffering of Jesus Christ must be the motivating factor in all preaching. And in all preaching, the power of the preaching does not come from what we can do for God. The power of the preaching is what God has done, will do, and has been doing in behalf of us in the Holy Most Sanctuary so that we continue to beat and respond positively. Amen? But often, the cross of Calvary is not presented before the people. Some may be listening to the last sermon they would ever hear. And the golden opportunity is lost and is lost forever. Perhaps many here in Pasai is already hearing the last sermon of their life and would commit suicide right after the service. Many are, are, are just coming to Pasai church because this is the last service they would go, do before they do the great sin that they are about to do and decide to do it as soon as the divine worship is ended. But as soon as they hear the hope that comes from Christ, they do otherwise. The gospel has borne fruit in their hearts and they respond positively if we only preach Calvary. Amen? If we only preach Calvary. And if in connection with this theory of the truth, 
Christ and His redeeming love has been proclaimed. <clears throat> if only Christ and His redeeming love is proclaimed, this might have won. This might have been won to His side. Instead of preaching discourses or telling something about, you know, with other people, sharing something, why don't we? And sometimes we evil surmise, we talk about the badness of people. Why don't you talk about your own badness? <laughs> But no, let us talk about Christ. Fix our eyes on Jesus and fix other people's eyes on Jesus. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth from the Word of God from now on as you read the Scripture, if you want to really understand the Scripture and have the assurance of salvation daily, Study the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. The object of reading the Scriptures is to find Calvary in every text in the Scripture. Just as Jesus was saying, have you not read from the law and the prophets how the Messiah must suffer? And when they heard about explanation of the Old Testament, that all is pointing out to one road, and that road leads to Calvary, they were burning within themselves and said, had not our heart been burning while he was Bible studying us along the road? It was the understanding of the whole scriptures in the light of Calvary that brought burning desire in their hearts. Many of us, with flickering embers are just blowing up our embers, keeping ourselves within the church, not burning other mountains, you know, with wildfire of the gospel. Why? Because we miss the point. And what is the point? There's only but one point that we miss, the road of Calvary. The blood of Jesus Christ must always be the end of every study. Even if you study Genesis or Revelation or whichever you study, if it does not go to the blood that washes the robes of each of us, it does not avail, it is not an assurance of salvation. And we continue to what? To burn out rather than burn in fire of love for God. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. So Ellen White would always say, why don't you study the last chapter of the gospel while Jesus Christ was about to be crucified? This is the most powerful of all. That's why the Bible says, they have the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And what is the power of godliness? Christ and Him crucified is the power of godliness. Having learned many things, but never able to acknowledge the truth. The truth is that Jesus came into this earth to sacrifice Himself for you, that you may know His love, and that His love may burn within you. And that that love, that neither death, neither life, nor, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate you from the love of God. God is sanctifying you with an understanding so that you will know His love, love that never separates. Now, when you talk about something that we can do, it is something that we cannot trust upon. Things that we can do for God are chaff. Things that we can do for God are sand, sinking sand sinking sand. I present before you, Ellen White says, I present before you the grand monument of mercy, the regeneration, salvation, and redemption. The Son of God uplifted on the cross must be preached on the top of your voice. Now, many of us would master Sabbath. It's good because it's a distinctive doctrine. We master Sabbath. We can have like what? 100 texts on Sabbath, but one or two texts on Christ and Him crucified. What happened on the cross? Why did God sacrifice His Son? 
But God could give His only begotten Son to become man's substitute. I like the word substitute. When Isaac is about to be killed, the Lord kept him from killing Isaac because Isaac cannot satisfy salvation. So he said, no, I have a lamb for you. We have a better Isaac. Isaac was carrying his wood that would burn him, but Jesus Christ carried the, the wood that would, you know, crucify him. Amen? This is a better idea of substitution. And not only that, I like the word substitution. He became sin for us. You know the favorite song, His life for mine? His heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am free. The cross he suffered brought me healing. The nail that pierced him set me free. His life for mine, his life for mine, how could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die, to save a wretch like me. What love divine, he gave his life for mine. It's not that, that only he gave his you know, life for mine. It's not only his death that is our substitute. His life was our substitute so that we are complete already in Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 says, Ye are complete in him. Sometimes we continue to struggle to be perfect. But why do you continue to struggle with your perfect? But if you abide in Christ, you are perfect in him. His perfection is your perfection. And when you stay, his life that he lived 2,000 years ago becomes your life. You no longer have to face God with your perfection. You have to face God with his perfection on your side. You don't only take the death of Christ, you take the life of Christ for yourself. And not only the life he lived, the life he continues to live right now in the sanctuary becomes yours if you abide in him, if your mind abide in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says, We demolish all arguments and every pretension that set itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take our thoughts captive to make it obedient to Christ. And what is, how do you captive your, your mind to make it obedient to Christ? The love of Christ constraineth us. It's only His love. Study the love of God. And I would tell you, you cannot but love Him. It's hard to go to hell. Ellen White in Steps to Christ says, in order to go to hell, I'm not quoting it, I mean quote and quote the idea, in order to go to hell or to be damned, you need to be constantly, consistently reject the grace of God. And how do you do, how do you reject the grace of God? Tibay mo. Every second of the day, every day, God would tell you His love. And you have to constantly deny, just as Judas has denied constantly until his death, the love of God that he went to hell. But if you respond positively, how could you be lost? Amen? If you respond daily, well, time to time would fall down. Time to time would fall. A righteous man falleth seven times, but the wicked falleth and never able to recover. Why? Because they consistently resist the grace of God. Do not resist the grace of God and that grace would change you and sanctify you and justify you. The Bible says, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ. Don't talk about your life. Don't talk about what you have accomplished or, or what you have failed. It is not about you. It is not what you have accomplished or what you failed. It is about what Christ has accomplished and never failed for you. When Christ, who is our life, I like this, Christ, our life. Sometimes we think that this life that we live is the, the real life. No. The real life that we live is what life, what Christ has lived 2,000 years ago and what Christ wants to live today in your life that is the real life. Your life today is an imaginary life you wanted to think as reality. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. 
The life that must appear when Christ shall appear must be the life that you believe is the life of Christ in you, not your life trying to live for Christ. In Galatians, this is a temptation. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2 to 3 says, Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of the faith? Are you so foolish, having begun with the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? When we were newly baptized, we were asking for the Holy Spirit to work with us. But at the end, when we already can baptize people by the hundreds without the Holy Spirit, we do it. And the Lord said, on the, among the Ten, the five foolish virgins, I, I, I don't know you. At first, they were dependent on the oil of the Holy Spirit, but at the end, when they already know how to do things, they were already confident that they can do things without the Holy Spirit. And by this, the Lord says, I do not know you. You didn't have the relationship with me. You are dependent on yourself and not to me. You think that your keeping of the law can save you? It damns you. The keeping of the law must be just in harmony with the love that I give you, not the way to your salvation. What about our sanctification? No matter what we think of it, it is God that sanctifies. Even our own sanctification counts to nothing. The Bible says, the spirit of prophecy says, the religious services, just like this. The prayers, the praises, the penitent confession of sin, ascend to, from the true believers. I'm talking about true believers as incense to the heavenly sanctuary. But is it acceptable? But passing through the corrupt channels of humanity, they are so defiled that unless purified by blood, they can never be of value with God. You think you're sanctified? You think you obeyed everything? None of it is acceptable to God. Only the offering of Christ is acceptable to God. So sprinkle it with your blood. Remember the Ten Commandments when it was given in Sinai? It was sprinkled with blood and the people who said we will do it was sprinkled with blood. Should they fail to obey the law, it is still the blood that would wash them from their iniquity. Amen? Now, how many of us trust already that the blood is only needed at the initial but it's not any more needed when you already accomplish the law. Woe unto you, for no matter how we accomplish the law, it cannot satisfy the demands of God. Perfection is only found in the blood of Christ. And if you stick with the blood, just as the Israelites stick in the blood that was shed, put on the doorpost, they were safe. But if they go out of the house without the blood, they are dead. Many of the Seventh-day Adventists, even those who keep the law and are vegetarian, the, with a vegetarian breath, without the blood, will still fail and not have the assurance of salvation. For I know that in me there is nothing in my flesh that dwelleth, dwelleth no good. Nakita nyo na ba? Sa ilong nyo, meron bang magandang lumalabas? Sa mata nyo? Sa bibig? Sa tenga? Sa puwet? Sa lahat? Nothing good, either physically or morally, nothing good comes out of us. If there is anything good that comes out of you, it is not you. There is the fountain of it. It comes from God. Amen? Because all good things come from above. Nothing comes from this earth. These are they which that come out of tribulation, both the 144,000 and the great multitude. All of them were washed, the robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. No one said that it was by keeping of the commandments that they belonged to the 144,000 and the saved. It was by the same blood that they washed their robes upon. And what is justification? Is it the work of God? It, it is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. If you think you can do justification, you are no longer justified. Remember the, the adulterous woman caught on adultery? When she was caught on adultery, people was trying to stone him because she deserved to be stoned. Isn't she? 
She deserved to be stoned. But when the Lord said, okay, wrote something on the ground and said, okay, those who have not sinned first would stone him. Stone her. And nobody stoned her. And then the Lord said, where are your accusers? None. And then Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. What a justification statement. Neither do I condemn thee. Now let me ask you a question. Did she do anything to deserve justification? Did she do anything to deserve justification? Did, the only thing she did not do was to justify herself. So the moment you justify yourself, you are no longer justified. But the moment you confess your sins, you are covered by the, the insurance policy of heaven. The Lamb of God incorporated. Amen. The Lord covers you with His blood. And when men see that their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Why? Because justification is what? Laying to the dust the glory of man. The Lord would constantly break you until you are broken because the spirit of prophecy says, unless you are broken, you are worthless. Akala ko, pagka, pag ang pottery, mahal, kailangan walang flow. Pero hanggat hindi ka nababasag, wala kang halaga sa Panginoon. Unless you are broken, you are worthless. The Lord wants to break you because when you are broken, you needed God. See, I like the illustration that Jesus Christ is our sin so that we no longer sin. Amen? See, see Jesus lies na naging kasalanan pa rin magkasala. He was on a serpent rod so that whoever looks at the serpent looks at sin, his own representative. So that whenever you think about sinning, think about Christ. Because you don't no longer have to sin because Christ has already become a sinner for you. Think about being as Christ. Amen? Our substitute. You don't need to sin. You just need to look on Christ. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Look at yourself, look at Christ, and you will see your own right, unrighteousness. We are not to be anxious about what Christ and God think of us, but about what God thinks of Christ, our substitute. Sometimes we think of, what, what does God think about me? What does God think about me? Forget about yourself. <laughs> it's not about you. It's about Christ, your substitute. Do you claim Christ as your substitute? Or do you continue to struggle to do righteousness? If you do continue to do struggle against righteousness, I tell you, you become weary and tired. And the Lord said, come to me. All of you are tired of doing righteousness because you're doing it by your own efforts. Come to me and I will give you rest. When you don't struggle to become righteous, you gain righteousness. Amen? Those who love to have life will lose it. And those who are willing to give life will have it. But about what God thinks about Christ, our substitute, ye are accepted as the beloved. In giving up all for God, you fall upon the rock and are broken. Give up all to Him without delay, for unless you are broken, you are worthless. And how do you say broken in Tagalog? Basag, no? But in accounting, in accounting, what is brokenness? Broken means wala pera. Broke. Nothing anymore in our account. When you are broken, you are broke, God puts His account for you. Amen? Wilt thou lay down thy life? Remember? The boasting pride of Peter. Lord, where are you going? Said, where I go, you cannot come. No, 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 Lord. I will die for you. And then the Lord said, really? 
Will you lay down your life for my sake so you become my Savior? Verily, verily, I say unto you, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me three times. But the text did not end here. It says in 14 verse 1, immediately after that, but let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, continue to believe in me. Because even if you deny me three times, I have prepared a place for you. And where I go, I will go back again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you will not be left alone here, even in your own unworthiness. I can accept you. Even Judas. But Judas denied, 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 denied the love of God. But Peter accepted the love of Jesus. Accept the love of Jesus and you will never fail to have the assurance of his salvation. So Jesus said, only if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. When you go out from here, study your scripture. See how you can find the love of Jesus. And when you go out of your own workplace, tell them about what Jesus has done for them. No discourse should ever be preached. In this pulpit, the only authorized person to, to preach is in this pulpit are those who are willing to preach Christ and Him crucified. Not those people who are willing to preach themselves whose long list of introduction is needed. Whose people is willing to say about themselves. Who says, hindi naman sa pagmamayabang, no? Kung wala kasi ako, wala talaga itong church na ito. And shame to these people who has been saved by the blood of the Lamb. No discourse should ever be preached without presenting Christ and Him crucified. If you preach and you don't present Christ and Him crucified, step down. Don't preach. As the foundation of the gospel. It is the constant realization of the preciousness of the Christ atoning sacrifice in behalf that qualifies us to point others to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. What qualifies you to be a preacher is if you preach the, la the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The greatest preacher that has ever introduced Christ was John the Baptist. He was great not because he was great. He was great because he decreased so that Christ may increase. In the, the only way to lift Christ is to lift yourself down so that Christ will be lifted up. Because if you lift yourself up, Christ will be degraded. We must become exponents of the efficacy of the blood of Christ by which our own sin have been forgiven. Only thus can we reach the higher classes. Because hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. There is no other gospel but Christ on the cross. This is our message, our argument, our doctrine, our warning to the impenitent, our encouragement for the soaring and the hope for every believer. Lift Christ up. He must increase. We must decrease. And Jesus, Helen White continues to say, do not climb the pole, but only look. I present Christ to you. Look and live. The badness of your heart should not keep you away from Christ. First John chapter 3, verse 20 says, when your heart when you cannot trust your heart, God is greater than your heart. Look and live. The badness of your heart should not keep you away from Christ, but bring you closer to the only hope, your only helper. All you have now to do is to look to Jesus who was lifted up and live. Look to Jesus. For if our heart condemn us, 
God is greater than our heart and no one ought things. You cannot hide anything from Christ. You can just submit to Him. From that on, when Ellen White has preached the eternal gospel, wrote many letters, the church grew. Right now, we have already 82,794 ch churches. The membership has rose to 20 million. There were many ordained pastors, and all of these are the results. If we continue to lift up Christ, we will continue to grow individually, and the church will grow and finish the work of the gospel. May the Lord bless us as we, we lift Christ up today.